Hey guys, I'm here to read a couple chapters of I Will Always Write Back. Um, today we are on Martin, April 1998. I had always wanted to see an American dollar. People often said that money grew on trees in America. Seeing this crisp green bill tucked so neatly in Caitlin's letter made me think that this may have been true. It looked so new, so hopeful, like a leaf in the springtime. I had just laid it on the bed when Nation came into the house. Whoa, he said, where did you get that? Caitlin sent it, I said. We both bent over it to get a better look. It was bigger than our Zimbabwean dollar, though I rarely saw those either. My parents used coins primarily. How much do you think it's worth, I asked. Nation shrugged his shoulders. We both knew it was worth more than a Zimbabwean dollar, especially with inflation, which was escalating daily. Suddenly the room was awash with a big swath of sunlight. I turned to see my mother's small silhouette in the doorway. Why are you all standing around, she asked. Your father will be home soon. Ma, I said, handing her the dollar. I received another gift from Caitlin. My mother's eyes grew wide, like a child spotting an elephant. Why would she send such a thing, she asked, though it sounded more like an accusation. Her question startled me. Suddenly I worried that my request for a dollar may have been out of line. Truly, I was just curious. We were sharing information about each other's culture, but I realized by the look on my mom's face that I had asked too much. I asked her to send it, I said. I did not think it was such a big deal. Well, it certainly is, she said, still stern. Your friend must be very wealthy, and you must keep this safe, Martin. When I showed my father the bill that, e that evening, his face lit up. This is the real thing, he said. How much is it worth, Nation asked. My father shook his head. I will take it to work tomorrow to ask my boss, he said. He will know. My mother winced. You must bring that back, she said. That's Martin's money. My father turned to me and winked. Your mother always so worried. That following evening, my father arrived more joyous than I had seen him in many months. Your friend gave you a very generous gift, he explained. This may be worth 20 Zim dollars. I was stunned. It felt too big of a responsibility for me. So I asked my mother to keep it in a safe place until I knew what to do with it. The dollar stayed put for two weeks. By then, we had been eating sadsa for days on end, no beans or even collard grains, and our mealy meal was running low. I could see the strain on my mother. She would make a pot every morning, and we'd eat it clean. In the evenings, our portions were smaller than usual. Simba complained he was still hungry. Ma, I said one day as my stomach groaned from hunger, let's use Caitlin's money for groceries. She shook her head. That is for your future, Martin, she said. Our future is now, I explained. She reluctantly agreed and then climbed on top of her bed to get the dollar from the box. We went to the post office to exchange it. The teller did not even have to check any charts or use a calculator. One American dollar is 24 Zim dollars, she said. My mother looked as surprised as I felt. My heart quickened. I nodded to her and she exchanged the dollar. We went directly to the market and bought enough groceries for two weeks. That night, we ate beans and collard greens with our sadsa. And the following morning, we had bread and tea for the first time in many months. It was April in Zimbabwe, but all this good food felt like Christmas, all thanks to my new friend in America. The next evening, with a full belly, I wrote Caitlin a letter. I thanked her for the very generous dollar bill and told her I would send her something in return soon. I considered sending her a Zimbabwean dollar, but knew that was one day's worth of sadsa. So instead, I made the only promise that I knew I could keep, that I would always write back, no matter what. Caitlin, May, 1998. Seventh grade spring was ridiculously busy and dramatic. Drew asked me out again in December, and then we broke up on New Year's Eve. I wanted to start 1998 fresh, and that meant dating Brennan. He and I were together for less than a month when Krista told me that she liked him, too. That was tricky. By then, Krista was my best friend. Lauren and I were in a fight. 
She gave me back the best part of our friendship necklace. Then Krista and I went to the mall and bought a new necklace together. Then Krista got so mad at me for dating Brennan that she gave me back the friend part of our necklace. So I was without a best friend, but still dating Brennan. I was torn. I really liked Brennan, but he wasn't worth losing a best friend over. I broke up with him and he started dating Krista. I couldn't believe she said yes. I was so upset that I didn't invite her to my 13th birthday on March 28th. It was a Saturday, so I had a party and all my friends came, except Krista. Lauren and I were back to being best friends. I had six different best friends that spring, at different times and for different reasons. It was hard to keep straight. At least there was one constant in my life, Martin. He kept writing. Most of the other students in my English class had stopped corresponding with their pen pals after two or three letters. But by the end of seventh grade, I had at least six letters from Martin. I kept them all in my desk drawer. In the early ones, he'd ask simple question, like, what's your favorite music? And what does your house look like? But in the last letter he sent me, he asked how much it costs to go to school. I figured he did not realize I was in public school and I wondered if he would think differently of me as a result. I hoped not. In that same letter, he said that his dad worked at a paper mill. I wasn't sure what that was, or if we even had them in the United States. I bought all my stationery at Staples, and I did notice that while my stationery was either a pristine white with pale blue lines through it, or pink with decorative edges, Martin's was always different. Some letters were written on grainy gray paper. Some were written on the back of homework assignments. Sometimes he wrote in pen, other times in pencil, but his penmanship was constant, a bubbly cursive. He always curled the tip of his H's and his Z's looked like chubby threes. His letters always put me in the best mood. They were often funny too. I had heard monkeys lived in the trees in Africa and asked him if that was true. He wrote back that there were lots of monkeys living in Muter and that he actually got into a fight with one once. Monkeys are really nasty, he wrote, which made me so sad because I had wanted a pet monkey for the longest time. He said there were more baboons than monkeys in his hometown and everyone considered them a nuisance. I think our baboons are like your squirrels, he wrote. In my response, I wrote that many people in the US thought squirrels were annoying but I actually loved them. That's because I loved all animals. At the time, I had a pet rabbit called Lewis. I got him in sixth grade. He had long floppy ears that bounced off the ground when he hopped. Lewis was so attached to me that one day he followed me out the door to go visit Heather, my best friend and neighbor. It was the sweetest thing. He started following me all over the neighborhood. My mom put a little bell on his collar so we always knew where he was, which was unnecessary because he never left my side. He became our neighborhood mascot. When I played kickball in the street, he'd run wherever I ran. The only time it was a problem was when we played flashlight tag. Everyone always knew where I was because Lewis's bell would ring. I told Martin about Lewis, expecting him to tell me about his pets. Instead, he wrote, the story of your rabbit is very amusing indeed. In Zimbabwe, we eat rabbits. They are quite delicious. I was so horrified. I didn't know how to respond. So I put that letter aside and then got so swept up with life when I finally sat down to write him back several weeks later, I made a point not to mention Lewis. I ended with, if you could please send me a new picture of you so I can show my friends how nice you are. You are the best pen pal that I have ever had. Again, I am so sorry for not writing back right away. Thank you for being a great friend, best of friends. Before I sealed up the envelope, I remembered that in all my crazy drama, I forgot Martin's birthday, which was three weeks before mine. I also remembered that I wanted to send him a Reebok t-shirt. His birthday was the perfect reason. I called Lauren to see if she wanted to go shopping later that afternoon. My mom drove us to a discount store in town called Ross, where I found a white, t or a white shirt with blue trim that had Reebok across the front 
in matching navy blue. Perfect, I thought. As I was paying for it, Lauren asked, Caitlin, are you like in love with Martin? The question caught me off guard and was hard to answer. I love him like a brother, I said finally. Ew, she said, that's like incest. You know what I mean, I said, swatting at her. He feels like a member of my family. Back home, I wrapped the shirt and attached a note that read, this is what all the cool kids in Hatfield wear. Hope you enjoyed this part.